Fantastic. So we're, we're starting a new series this morning uh, that we've called The Way of Jesus. Uh, and this is a series that's going to take us all the way up until Christmas. And I just want to start this morning by, by just giving us something of a bit of an overview of where we're going to be going over the next few weeks. And I want to begin by asking this question. Who are you trusting to lead you into the right life? Who are you trusting to lead you into the right life? You know, since I've got back from sabbatical, you might probably be getting sick to the back teeth of me talking a lot about social media, but I'm going to do it again. Because we, we live in a day and age that has seen the rise of this term, the influencer. Have you heard about that? The influencer. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, then if you still watch the television, then you, you'll put on a television program, something like, uh, you know, Celebrity Master Chef or Strictly Come Dancing or something like that. And you'll, you'll see on it, you'll see a number of people like, you know, that retired ex-cricketer that everybody knows or the B BBC news reporter. But you'll also always get these people that are suddenly springing up on all of these programs and they say, you know, he's a social media celebrity. Or, or, or an, an influencer, a social media influencer, even though you have got no idea who they are. Is that just me? I, I haven't got a clue who half of them are. They, when, when they play these celebrity football games, I don't even know half the people are anymore. But whether it was Joe Wicks getting the country moving uh, and doing exercise during lockdown, or whether it's some brand champion trying to sell you a revolutionary new makeup product, with the right amount of access, we feel like we know these people, and because of that, we trust them. They are influencers. And it's not just limited to that. You might have seen this happen more and more. People put out blogs, don't they? Things like the five ways to keep your house tidy in five minutes every day. Or, or check out this free webinar for how you can be a published author without writing any books. All that kind of stuff. And it even happens, dare I say, in church circles. You know, the seven key ways to get your church to grow. Twelve steps to make your church more outward looking. There is so much content that is being produced every single day, appealing to each and every circumstance. And because we've got this habit of death scrolling uh, that I've spoken about, we mindlessly drink it all in. And, and you hear people talking about that stuff, who they're following. You know, do you follow the five-minute mum? She's revolutionized my life. Or, or do you follow Athlean X, that guy, Jeff Cavalier? He's completely transformed my exercise regime. But let's face it, this isn't something that is new and limited to the online world. It often lies behind the type of newspaper that we read or the news channels that we watch. These influences are all around us. And the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, is something we've heard of for a while. And not only, for, not only that, for some people, influence comes from the friendships that we build, build. The people who we listen to and confide in about the big stuff. We seek their influence on their life. And some people, they crave influence. They want to be influential people. They want people to come and to listen to them. It's why people become church ministers, because you have to listen to them. I joke. <laughs> but people crave influence. They want to feel as though they matter. They want to feel as though what they say matters. They want relevance, and they want affirmation. And it's why we're going to be looking at this series, The Way of Jesus. Because very often, the reality is we find ourselves going in all kinds of different directions, following different ways of being, being influenced by different people, when I believe that as followers of Jesus, we are to follow the ways of Jesus. Amen? 
And so what, this is what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of months. And what I want to do this morning by way of overview is just to give us some orientation as to what different ways that we can go. And the first way is the way of the world. Now, when we talk about the way of the world, we're not talking about, you know, the cosmos. We're not talking about what God has made. We're not necessarily talking about the people because we are all image bearers of God. Now, when we talk about the way of the world, we're talking about the social and cultural practices that are opposed to God and his plan for this world. Now imagine a girl in the 21st century who is lost to image. You know, she says, I don't feel beautiful. And her, and her friend says to her, what are you talking about? You are beautiful. But the girl says, you know, the magazines that I read, the things that I see on Instagram and Facebook every day, they tell me that I'm not beautiful, that I'm not enough, that I need to try harder. And these magazines, these social media influencers, they're all under pressure to sell. And they're part of a wider industry. And so they Photoshop. They filter the life out of every image to make themselves look better than they really are. And they present what is a lie to the people looking at the pictures. And they play on women and men's insecurities and anxieties about the way that they look. All with the aim that people buy the products they're promoting and selling. They tell you what you should wear, what you should buy. And you get it with all of these creams that apparently reverse the aging process. I mean, we just don't need to look around the room. It's not working! Thank you, thank you. Imagine finding a baby in a tub of like anti-aging cream and going, oh, I've gone too far. <laughs> but there's a whole system that's in place to make products sell. A system that preys on people's vulnerabilities and anxieties. And in some places, not all, there will be some people who are put into slavery or working for barely anything in order to make cheap clothes so we can look a certain way. And Is that what? There we go. There's a whole system that's in place for what we wear and how we look. And so the anxieties that that girl feels... And the mental health issues that surround all of that are coming from a whole system that is putting pressure on her. This is what happens in the 21st century when we have a system and a society that opposes God's ways. This is the way of the world. And the problem is, it's seductive to us. Ephesians 2 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. I, I said this last week, the way of the world is you be you. You deserve this. You go for it. You matter the most. Your happiness is the most important thing in this world. And if you take that mindset with the way that our culture and our society operates, you can get to a point where you begin idolizing yourself. Think of David in the Bible. He who once was saying, 
One thing I ask from the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. He gave himself over to the way of the world. He used his position, he used his influence in order to get what he wanted. And so instead of gazing on the beauty of the Lord, he's gazing on the beauty of someone else's wife. In a culture where she can't do anything about it. He's the king after all. The system means that she has to do what he wants. He's abusing the power and authority that God has given him. And that's symptomatic. We live in a culture and in an age that idolizes the self. You be you. And our moral compass and our moral outlook is increasingly being affected by the original lie that was told in the garden. Did God really say that? Did God really say you can't have that? Perhaps he doesn't want you to be happy. Friends, the enemy wants to draw you into a place where you follow the way of the world and not the way of God. He wants you to think that God is this cosmic killjoy and that if you follow the way of the world, you'll be able to have everything that you want. But it doesn't work like that. It's why I chose this passage for this morning Can the blind lead the blind? We use that a lot, don't we? It comes from Jesus. The blind leading the blind. And the worldly blind lead people to the pit of despair. Whereas you were made for an intimate relationship with God. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. In 10 years of pastoral ministry... I've been involved in situations where people have chosen the way of the world over the way of Jesus. Sometimes it's, it's been a dramatic thing. Sometimes it's come about through a significant trauma, like an affair or a divorce. But I have to say, very often it's just come about because of drift. People have just slowly drifted away from Jesus prioritizing other things, seeing other things as important. Now, I don't need to go to church every week. I need to have time for myself, some me time. Now, it doesn't matter if I don't give. God wouldn't want me to be hard up. You know, I don't need to serve or be involved. I'm just too busy for the rest of the week. He wouldn't want me to be tired. I'm not going to go to small group. That's not feeding me. I'm not actually getting anything out of it. And just piece by piece, choice by choice, it's just a slow, gradual drift. A sequence of believing that actually they must be the exception. That almost like they're the asterisk in the Bible. And the reality is before they know it, they don't know who they are anymore. Jesus even said this, what do you benefit If you gain the world, but lose your soul. It's one of the most devastating things about this job. It's seeing people heading for a pit of despair. They've put all of their energy and their focus into what they think the world is telling them that they need, only to find that when they get it, it's meaningless. In ministry, I've come across so many people who have just lost their soul and they'd do anything to get it back. So what's the alternative when we're confronted with the way of the world? Well, One of the things we think to ourselves is, well, you know what, I better be really good then. And actually, that isn't the way of Jesus either. That's the way of religion. The way of religion is, well, I better be really good then. It's an external focus without an inward reality. You've got to do the right thing. 
your behavior is what matters. But isn't it fascinating that when Jesus sees the religious people, when he's around them, these people who are supposed to be representing God, he is not happy with what they've done. He even says to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead Everything is unclean. Friends, the sad reality is people can come to church every Sunday for their whole life and never really change. People can be in positions of leadership in the church and they cannot look a thing like Jesus. They might praise him in public on a Sunday, but for the rest of the week, their heart is hard. David Banner puts it like this. Often people are religious, not because they think they need God, but because they want to control God. Religion is an attempt to deal with the disaster of the human condition by manipulating the divine. Jesus says in Matthew 15, these people, they honor me with their lips. They say the right stuff but their hearts are far from me. Friends, what God is after is dealing with our hearts. What the way of religion is trying to do is about the elimination of bad behavior. Tim Keller defines religion as salvation through moral efforts. And he said that this leads to self-centeredness in two forms. Being bad and breaking all the rules, or being good and keeping all the rules and becoming self-righteous. It's just as possible to avoid Jesus by keeping all the rules as it is by breaking them. The Pharisees, for example, they, they built their sense of worth on their moral and spiritual performance. Well, aren't I doing good I'm doing the right thing. I'm all right. They were creating almost like this resume to God and the world. And this leads inevitably, it seems, to self-righteousness, to exclusion, to insecurity, to anger, and generally unattractive people. As I was kind of reflecting on this, This dynamic of the way of the world and the way of religion, I think it's best seen in that story about the two lost sons. We call it the prodigal son, don't we, often? But actually it's a story about two sons that are lost. One who loses himself to the world and the way of the world, and the other who loses himself to the way of religion. You get the one son who goes and he blows everything on this worldly stuff. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And he discovers that none of it can actually satisfy. But you've then also got this older brother in the story, the one that we see right at the very end, the one who apparently never left the father. He was a good boy, did as he was told. But when his brother returns, he grumbles and he moans. He's always played by the rules. He's always done the right thing. And yet he's bitter at his father's attitude of forgiveness when his younger sibling comes home. Friends, the way of religion is the way of comparison and resentment. Comparing your apparent goodness and righteousness to somebody else. If you have ever found yourself comparing yourself to your brothers and sisters in the church, what they do, what they don't do, then friend, you are heading for the way of religion. And Jesus' charge is the same. It's what a passage that follows this one that we've been reading. Hypocrite. Take your plank out of your own eye first. Jesus didn't say, I've come so that you'll follow all the rules. He said, I've come so that you may have life and have it to the full. And that's why there's this third way, the way of Jesus. 
Jesus' vision is to train us up so that we will be like him. And it's all built on trust and love. It's why he says, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. The world promised you that you can do whatever you want without consequence and it will lead to fulfillment. And you know what? It won't. It doesn't. The way of religious people is if you do everything right, you'll finally feel like you're good enough and you'll feel worth it in the world. And if not, you'll be overcome by shame and resentment. But Jesus says, you are a total mess. You are a total mess. But I love you anyway. He sees us for who we really are. He sees us in all of our sin, in our dysfunction, and he dies for us on a cross. Hallelujah. To take away this desire to have to prove ourselves, to take away our shame. And he gives us his love as a sign of his grace. The fullness of life comes only when our soul finds rest in him. And so when Jesus uses these words, when he says, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher, I found out something quite interesting. The word fully trained comes from the Greek word kartasio, which is to render fit or complete. And it's a word that's also used to describe repairing what is broken. We are a total mess. And if you don't think you are, you probably are. I hate to tell you that. We are broken people. But when we follow in the ways of Jesus, when we aim to be like Jesus, he can take what is broken and render it fit for purpose. Hallelujah. And so radical discipleship in the way of Jesus, it's not just about trying to keep yourself from sinning, but it's about reorientating your life around the person of Jesus. When we obey what he calls us to do, resolving not to only learn from him, but act like him. And when we do that, we move from some generic faith to living explicitly for Jesus. Dallas Willard puts it like this. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Love that. Someone asked me this week, you know, what has been the biggest challenge that I want to get across to the church since I've been in a sabbatical? And it's this. I want you to take your walk with Jesus seriously. I want us to be fully trained so that we will be like our teacher. That's what discipleship is. That's what Jesus' disciples were doing with him. They were following him around, doing life with him. They were making mistakes, but they were still following him. All with the aim that they would learn from him and live like him. And Jesus' great commission to them was to go and make more of you. Go and make more disciples. People who look like Jesus. That's the call of this church and every church. To make people, to make disciples who look like Jesus. C.S. Lewis said this, If the church is not making disciples, then all cathedrals, Clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible are a waste of time. If we are not following in the way of Jesus, if we're not learning to live like him, then all of this is pointless. The last half an hour of your life has been pointless. If we're not being challenged, if we're not being changed by what we see when we send see Jesus 
And maybe we're not following his way. but We're following the way of religion. Richard Foster puts it like this. The aim is not external conformity, whether to doctrine or deed, but the reformation of the inner self, of the spiritual core, the place of thought and feeling of will and character. The psalmist cries, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Three things quickly as I close. In following in the way of Jesus, we do it to be formed. I've talked about this a lot recently, about the way in which the world is forming us and potentially it is deforming us. When we follow the way of Jesus, we are formed in the way of Jesus. And that happens because of the Holy Spirit. We don't change because we've done stuff. We change because we invite the Holy Spirit to come upon us and change our hearts. There is staggering spiritual potential when we are formed by the Holy Spirit and not through our own efforts. The challenge is to be formed in the way of Jesus. It's also to be transformed. Romans 12 says this, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to this, the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't conform. Don't conform to the way of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when we follow the way of Jesus, we think differently to the way the world does. And we're going to see this throughout this series. We're going to look at how the way of Jesus is the way of self-denial. It's the way of radical obedience. It's the way of sacrifice. We also see how it's the way of confrontation at time. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind when we follow the way of Jesus. And then we're also to be conformed. Romans 8 to verse 29 speaks of Jesus being the first of what the new humanity is going to look like. Be conformed to the image of Christ. What would the world look like if people looked like Jesus? That's his kingdom. That's the answer. If we all looked like Jesus, that is what the kingdom of God will be. When we follow in the way of Jesus, the propaganda of the world is replaced by truth that sets us free. So as I close, I want to come to a passage from the prophet Haggai. I love this passage. This is what Haggai says. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have harvested much. Sorry, you've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord God Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains. Bring down timber. Build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Give careful thought to your ways. What way are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the way of the world? where it's all just going to be blown down anyway? 
Are you going to follow the way of religion that only leads to shame and resentment? Or are you going to follow the way of Jesus? God is saying to us, how can I bless you with kingdom life if you're giving all of your energy to the way of the world or the way of religion? So as we start this series, as we start this adventure in following in the ways of Jesus, let's begin by giving careful thoughts to our ways. Let's pray. I'd like to invite the band to come. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we've just been exploring this, I just sense that this might be hitting something within us. Whether we're, we're finding our place where we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling with worldliness. There are things that we're doing that we know that you know, aren't good for us. We're pursuing after things that we think are going to make us happy. Lord, I just pray that in the stillness now, that we would bring out of the darkness that that needs to be brought out into the light. What are the things that we're going after, that we're giving all of our energy to, that aren't your ways? We just bring it to you. But also, Lord, we, we, we just want to recognize in ourself that we can be really controlling, that we can be judgmental. And Lord, that a lot of this is coming from our fear. Our fear that we're just not enough. You know, some of the busiest people in the church are probably some of the most insecure in their spirit. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more or less. I just feel like some people need to hear that today. You are enough. And thank God it's not because of you. It's because of him. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, your grace that you pour out us in abundance because of Jesus. And we just pray, Lord, that we would give careful thought to our ways over the coming weeks. And that you would grow us to be more like your son. That we as a church would look like Jesus. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.